This is Rhett Reed Podcast. We take a deep dive into the Fear Street series. And review other books we've read. I'm Serge. And I'm Anna. We're happy you can join us. guys hey there welcome back to another exciting episode of red read podcast yeah we're recording again yeah and... we're right back in it but outside of the podcast we're doing this thing on twitter called the hashtag 30 day book challenge and it was actually created by the pro book nerds if yeah you wonderful a... wonderful podcast you guys should definitely give them a listen yeah they basically do author interviews that's their main thing and it's always really fun to listen for the month of november what they're doing is for every day they challenge you to Talk about a specific kind of book that you would recommend, and there's 30 different book categories. 30 different book prompts, I'd say. Mm. It would be like, what's your favorite series? What's your favorite book to gift to people? So each day would just be like a different thing like that. Right, and there's nothing like a 30-day book challenge to make oneself realize that you are perhaps not as well-read as you might think you are or maybe you are well read in one very specific narrow category and then maybe you just you know haven't broadened your horizons enough because they do put a bunch of different kinds of categories in there i'm the only one that hasn't been able to answer one of the questions and i think i struggled with like what's a book that made you cry happy tears and i was like nothing makes me happy i'm stone cold inside <laughs> So I wasn't able to answer that one. My struggle is always that I keep wanting to say Lord of the Rings for every single one of them because they fall into so many different categories. It's series of books, but then also, you know, it's made me cry happily. It's made me cry sadly. It's It's got a lot of stuff going on. There's characters from the series that, you know, I'd want to have dinner with. Honestly, I was struggling between two different characters in Lord of the Rings. Like, do I want to have dinner with Bilbo Baggins or do I want to have dinner with Treebeard. Basically, Anna's restricted me. She's like, well, you can't have Lord of the Rings for every single thing. So I'm kind of divvying it up. I'm putting like Return of the King for some and like Lord of the Rings for others. And I'm going to stick Fellowship and Two Towers in there somewhere, I'm sure. I did have one quibble with one of your answers. If you listeners out there want to comment on it, please feel free to. So one of the prompts was, what's a series that you would recommend? And Serge, what was your answer? So first of all, I want to preface this by saying like, At this point, I'd probably already used Lord of the Rings three or four times, and I didn't want, I mean, obviously I'd recommend Lord of the Rings to everybody, but wanted to, you know, switch it up a little bit. And I'd also already used Asimov's Foundation series for something, which is another series, trilogy, what have you, that I would definitely recommend. It's actually a series, it's more than just a trilogy, there's a lot of Foundation books, and actually, oh, there's a lot of prequels too, there's like the Galactic Empire books, and actually, even starting with this iRobot stories and all, wow, I'm really getting carried away. So I said, you know what? Let's switch it up a little bit. I really like Jules Verne, and I've read four or five of his books, and I know that two of them are definitely connected. I knew that 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and hashtag spoiler alert, Mysterious Island are connected. So I was like, okay, well, are those part of a series? And it turns out, yes, those two books are part of a series that are called Voyage Extraordinaire. Yes, It's French. I don't know. Voyage Extraordinaire. Pardon my French. So anyway... So I was like, okay, yeah, Voyage Extraordinaire, that is my recommendation for a series. And Anna's like, hold on a second, that's BS, you haven't read the other 50-some-odd books in the series. It's a 54-book series. Mm -hmm. Serge has only read five of the 54 books. Right. And he has zero interest, no interest, absolutely zip interest in reading the other 49 books in the series. Well, with titles like Two-Year Vacation... Right. And the tribulations of a Chinaman in China, I'm not exactly, you know, chaffing at the bit to, like, go read those so things. So my argument is, if you can't even recommend 10%. Okay, but I can recommend Around the World in 80 Days and but you're only recommending 20,000 five, you Leagues can't, Under the Sea and no, no, Mysterious no. Island. See, I'm and, talking over you because the argument is, if you can't recommend the entire series, you can't recommend a series. There's no caveats okay, to well, this. Okay, here's a caveat. I recommend this series. And a listener, or actually in this case, not a listener, but a Twitter follower, 
goes excitedly to their local bookshop and they go, oh, I have to read this series of books. Serge from Red Read Podcast recommended it. And I always go by what Serge says. He is, you know, his tastes are impeccable. And they go to the local bookshop and they go, okay, Mr. Bookseller, I want Voyages Extraordinaires by Jules Verne. What have you got? And guess what? They're going to have those five books that I read and nothing else. They're not going to have the the mysterious salesman from Salem. They're not going to have the voyages of the African entrepreneur. They're not going to have two-week vacation, okay? They're going to have the ones I already mentioned that I had read, and nothing else has gotten but it translated matter because you've, still in print. You've given the series itself your mm-hmm. stamp of right. approval. You have diminished the Surge stamp. <laughs> and that's my argument. And also, I haven't diminished it because nobody's going to be able to find those other books unless they go on the internet and get like stuff off of... Uh, Project Gutenberg? Project Gutenberg. By the way, shout out to Project Gutenberg. Those guys are amazing. Anyways, listeners, let us know what you think because I think it's total BS. And I also think it's really odd that with all the great female authors you've read, I don't think you've suggested any of them for the 30-day book challenge. Wow. And like I was thinking about the series, you have been one of the biggest people to recommend the Anne McAfee book series, like Dragons of Pern, or Ursula K. Le Guin's book series, Ooh. Earthsea. And for some reason, like your brain just went immediately to like, oh, I can't think of anyone aside from Tolkien or Asimov. To- wow. You know what? Honestly, I wish you had suggested Ursula K. Le Guin because that's obviously the better choice there. I mean, instead of choosing someone, you know, one of those two, you went no, immediately to I, a book series. You know, I wish you'd thought of this two weeks ago when we were doing it versus roasting me, like, live on the podcast right now. Because now I feel like I'm on the spot and uh, you have a very good point there. Well, I'm just going to criticize your male gaze, but, you know. Dang. All right. I acknowledge that. I, I can get behind that. You're right. Well, speaking of me being right. <laughs> so I recently read a book. And it's called My Sister the Serial Killer. I don't know if this has anything to do with me being right, but whatever. So My Sister the Serial Killer is by Oyinkin Brothwaite. And it was published really recently, November 20th, 2018. It's written by a Nigerian author. But it's a kind of a satire slasher. It's about a lot of things. It's about... It's a very feminist, strong woman book, first of all. And the main character is Koredi? Koreed? I can't pronounce these names. I'm so sorry if I'm butchering them. But Kareed is the older sister in this family. You know, she's very plain looking, but she's very serious and studious and, you know, gets things done. And she's a nurse. Her sister, Ayula, is spoiled, but very, very pretty. And she gets through the world based on her prettiness and the way she holds herself. Kareed is very jealous of her younger sister. She wishes that she could sort of, like, have her sister's life because... She's so beautiful. She gets everything she wants. And like, she's even going after this guy that Kareed actually really liked and saw first, a doctor in the hospital. The thing is, Ayula is a serial killer. Men she dates, they tend to end up dead. She ends up killing them. And she often calls on Kareed to help her cover up the murder. It's this hilarious, dark comedy almost, where they're trying to like cover up murders and cover up Ayula's tendencies. But there's also like this sister infighting. And then there's like the whole family dynamic where the father who's dead, that's a whole thing. And how the mom treats both daughters and how they're treated differently in society. And it's basically like a view on how society looks at women, how women know how men judge them. And more about the um, like social media and how people use social media and how people can manipulate social media to do certain things. When is a good time to be using the social media to get people to think what you want them to think? And how women can just see right through the basic wants of men and the basic actions of men. And it's a really fun read. And it's really, like, funny, but, like, dark funny. So I can see some people who don't have that twisted sense of humor, like, reading the book and going, what? But I really, really enjoyed it. It's a good time. Is it actually set in Nigeria? Yes, it's set in Lagos. I might want to pick this book up myself and, and give it a give it a shot because it's pretty short, right? It's like a little novella. It's about, according to Goodreads, it's 240 pages, but it went really quickly. I think I finished it in a night. Oh, wow. I mean, I do read quickly, but... <laughs> yeah, that would take me like three days <laughs> if I had time. But it's a fantastic book. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. If you have that twisted sense of humor, you're going to like it. It's funny, there's murder, if you like horror, if you like thrillers, if you like satire, I think you'll enjoy this book. Why don't we talk about 
Fear Street, The Dare. After this intermission. back and let's dive right into fear street the dare let's talk about our predictions i dare you to talk about your predictions Ooh, Ooh. well <laughs> my prediction was that a guy dares a girl to kill another girl as a prank because shady side kids are infinitely dumb and she agrees to do it mm. i said that the murder weapon would probably be something boring like stabbing with a knife or like shooting with a gun oh. and that the murderer gender i said it was probably gonna actually be done by the guy who dared her Ha! Huh. Look at that. That's not too shabby. Pretty darn good. That's pretty darn good. I predicted that it's going to be a female murderer. Weapon is going to be running somebody over as a dare. So she was going to like cover up like a hit and run by disposing of the body. But then the person's like actually not going to be dead, right? Because this is how it goes on Fear Street. Nobody knows first aid or how to check for a pulse. So she's going to end up actually killing the person by botching like a cover up. That doesn't happen, by the way. Well, the not checking for a pulse did happen. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, so those are my predictions. Yeah, I didn't do so hot, and I like got a better prediction accuracy this time around. Much like almost every other time around. I've been pretty bad, but this was actually a really, really good guess. What's this book about? The book is about Joanna Wise, and she's a girl at Shadyside High that wants to fit in with the rich kids. And this is the story of her sort of trials and tribulations as she tries to fit in with that crowd, even though she definitely doesn't belong there. Well, that brings us right into the characters, because there's a very intense divide. There's the rich kids, and then there's the poor kids. So we'll start with the poor kids, because we talked about Joanna Wise already, so let's describe her a bit. Joanna Wise is a junior in high school. She's skinny or very thin. Uh, she's also short and she's got long, straight black hair and dark brown eyes. She doesn't like her pointy nose and cleft chin and she actually gets depressed a lot. Just, you know, actually poverty can bring upon depression. She has the teenage issues of being sad about how she looks, about her friendship situation, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, she describes herself actually as quiet and mousy. A lot of female characters in Earl Stein's books are described as being mousy, and I don't really know what that means. Like timid or shy? Ah. Well, another reason she might be kind of depressed is that her mom is actually recently divorced. And so now, you know, her mom is the only one in the house that's taking care of her. But now, also, the mom has to work an extra job and take more hours in order to support the family by herself. Her mom's often out of the house. She does have a pretty crappy home life and a lot of things are going wrong for her, but she does have this one amazing friend that seems to be there for her. Her name is Margaret Rivers. Margaret is also a junior. She's a head taller than Joanna and a little bit chunky. She's got curly, carrot-colored hair and a face full of freckles and is not very pretty by Joanna's own description. What's hilarious is as you're reading more about Margaret, you just picture Barb from Stranger Things. Anna and I independently came to this conclusion. Anna was telling me, oh my god, when I was reading Margaret, I thought of, and then like I cut her off and like finished her sentence. And I was like, Barb from Stranger Things, right? And Anna was like, no way. And I already had it written in the outline too. So she was like, oh, you're right. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah, mean, because funny. she's really described as Barb. She even takes a secondary position in this book as it goes on. And she's sort of forgotten about as Joanna you know, mixes with the cool kids. And yeah. it's very Stranger Things, except without the Demogorgon, obviously. Yeah. Well, we don't know yet. I mean, there's all sorts of things lurking in the Fear Street woods. But I, I feel like I'm just going to be calling Margaret Barb because... Marb? Marb? I'll call her Marb. Marb. Because I've been thinking of her as Barb the entire time. So I'm just call her Marb. I'll call her Marb. Marb. It's fine. Uh, she actually drives a little white Geo. I thought that was cool because I actually knew a girl in high school that drove a little Geo. It seems like the high school girl car to drive. I mean, like, not if you're from North Hills, then you're going to be driving your daddy's Mercedes. But, you know, if you're just like a regular kid, then probably Geo, a used Geo is affordable. 
you know, if you work a job after school or whatever. In addition to, you know, the poor kids and the rich kids, we also have a teacher who plays a really big role in this book. Right. So before we get to the rich kids, let's talk about the teacher, who's really kind of like their nemesis in this story, as we'll come to find out. Mr. Northwood is actually Joanna's neighbor on Fear Street. Yes. He is tall and very lean, with thick, wavy gray hair and a stooped posture. He has watery blue eyes and a craggy face with lots of deep lines. So Uh he's described as kind of like a beardless Abe Lincoln or Clint Eastwood on a really bad day. Yeah, and here we get our character description celebrity reference for the book, except this time it's not one of the girls, it's a male teacher, which is a little bit of a switch up for him. He also is described as always wearing turtlenecks, which just kind of accentuates his huge Adam's apple. And here, I'm actually kind of picturing him looking like Steve Jobs. Because Steve Jobs has that, like, iconic kind of... I don't think it's a turtleneck, but it's like some kind of sweater that he wears. I thought it was a black turtleneck. Yeah, maybe it is. So, like, I kind of picture Steve Jobs. I mean, if we're going to talk about Steve Jobs, Mr. Northwood has this eccentricity where he tape records everything. He's always got a tape recorder, like, in his shirt pocket, and it's always on recording. And instantly, like, you know, okay, this has got to be, like, a plot point later on. And now we're going to talk about the rich kids, who obviously live in the North Hills because they're rich. And the rich kids of this book are all seniors. Yes, and then we got their ringleader to begin with, Dennis Arthur. And by the way, all these descriptions are Joanna's own descriptions, right? So Joanna describes him as being really great looking, with short black hair and green eyes. He looks like an athlete and is the star of the track team. He also laughs like a hyena, which is not the most flattering description. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not sure, like, how she finds that attractive, but... He's dating Caitlin Monroe, and all you really get about her is that she drives a red Miata two-seater, but I assume she's supposed to be, like, gorgeous or something. Yeah, you don't really get a lot of, like, character anything for her. She's kind of just there. She's kind of Joanna's nemesis. She's Joanna's nemesis, but it's, like, one-sided because she, you know, Joanna might as well not exist as far as Caitlin is concerned. Joanna sees her as like a nemesis, but Kaylin doesn't even know who Joanna exists. Next in the group, we have Melody Dawson. She has perfect little lips with a perfect little upturned nose and perfect creamy white skin and perfect blonde hair. Perfect. She's perfect. You gotta tell what Joanna thinks of the rich kids here with these descriptions, but she always wears spotless designer clothes, even to the point of like her gym clothes are luxury brand gym clothes. She's a stuck-up snob. Apparently her father runs several banks in town, and she actually drives a silver Mercedes. Next you have Lenny Barnes, and all we have for him is that he has blonde hair. So moving on to (laughs) Zach Hamilton. Hamilton. I don't know. I don't know anything. Bastard, orphan, immigrant, son of a whore. Yeah, so this guy is like the opposite of Alexander Hamilton, although apparently a distant descendant. He's a big guy built like a wrestler with curly red hair, And he wears bright blue sunglasses, like, 24-7. He claims to be related to Alexander Hamilton. He has a problem with his temper, though. Hamilton kind of had an issue with that, too. Maybe it runs in the family. Kind of just like your regular kind of frat bro kind of guy. I'm getting that impression from him. Especially with the whole sunglasses all the time. Well, I mean, did he punch the bursar? (laughs) Um, I think the sunglasses are because... He probably drinks a lot and he's like covering up his bloodshot eyes or maybe like smokes Or he could be high a lot. Anyways, he has curly red hair. In-depth plot. Let's talk about this book. We're done with the people. Let's just get into it. Joanna and Margaret are eating hot dogs at a 7-Eleven. So because Joanna's mom is working these two jobs, they don't really get to eat dinner at home together. So Joanna just goes out and gets what she can. The 7-Eleven's like also like on the opposite side of town for some reason. I don't know. Like they're out at the end of like a road or something. I guess they want to drive all the way out there. But for some reason, the rich kids are also there and they notice them as they're checking out and buying their hot dogs because the rich kids are like off in the corner goofing off by the Slurpee machine. Yeah, they're having a a Slurpee fight within the 7-Eleven. And when I was reading this, I kept thinking Squishy, the Quickie Mart. So anyways, they're having a fight in front of the Squishy machine (laughs) and it's just all over the floor. They're making a mess, like pouring it at each other and throwing it at each other. Obviously, the store clerk is not happy. And he actually confronts them and tries to get them to stop. Well, at this point, Dennis pulls a gun out of his pocket and shoots the clerk. Except it's a water gun. Ha 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 ha. Oh, that would so... That would not fly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, he would get, like, wrestled to the ground and beat down or something. But just as the clerk is about to call the cops on him, Zach shoves a wad of cash into the clerk's pocket to pay for the Slurpees in the mess. And, and they, they just all... walk out with grins on their faces because they are entitled little shits. Yep. And I will call them that many times throughout this. Entitled. Keep that word in mind, folks, because you get the definition of entitlement. We are at Mr. Northwood's class the next day, and Joanna wants to stay after class to ask, you know, a question about the essay they have to write, and she overhears a conversation between Northwood and Dennis. So what's happening here is that Dennis intends to miss the midterm exam because his family is going on vacation to the Bahamas, and basically he's like, well, I want to go on this vacation with my family. Can you give me, like, a makeup test? North was like, no makeup, and you can't bring a copy of the test with you, and you can't take it early. They just You miss this test, that's it. Right, so now Dennis is furious, because an F on the midterm means that he'll be ineligible for the track team, and he's on the track to make the Olympic team, right? He's actually like a real star athlete. You know, he's a senior, he's probably got a scholarship lined up at college. If he gets kicked off the track team because of this F, then it's going to be a really big problem, and, you know, all the other teachers have accommodated him. They're giving him a break. And he just doesn't get why Northwood doesn't do the same thing. Yeah, well, Northwood thinks that Dennis gets enough breaks. And that's the end of that. So now Dennis just storms out. He's upset. And he's just muttering to himself about how he could just kill Northwood. Joanna thinks that Dennis is really hot. And she sort of jumps in on his little one-sided conversations by giving him more ideas of how they could kill Northwood. I mean, she's no longer interested in asking the question about her essay. So so they kind of just, like, end up, like, standing by Dennis's locker, bounce ideas back and forth, and they just start adding torture upon torture upon torture. Like, I'm gonna fold him into a trunk and shoot him and then throw him in the legs. You know, just, like, keeps stacking up. Right. But sometime during that conversation, Joanna slips that Northwood is her neighbor, and Dennis is intrigued by this. But just as Joanna is about to ask Dennis out, Caitlin dries up. They're not by her his locker anymore. They walked out of school. But anyways, Galen drives up in her red two-seater, and she's obviously here to pick up Dennis. Now we get the first of one of Joanna's little oddities. Yeah, what happens is, and this might be related to her depression, the divorce, or who knows what, but like, she kind of slips into this dreamlike reverie and imagines things. And it's kind of her way of like dealing with like the frustrations she faces in everyday shady side high school life. In this weird little fantasy she has, she actually imagines herself throwing Caitlin out of the car, kicking her to the ground, beating her up, and then driving away with Dennis while he looks at her admiringly. And I was left standing there, my imagination playing out all kinds of evil scenes. Why do I have such violent fantasies? Why am I always picturing myself socking people in the jaw, pushing people down stairs or off cliffs, tearing people's heads off, and watching the blood gush up from their necks? Why do I always imagine myself doing the most horrible, unspeakable things? I guess it's because in real life, I'm such a total mouse. You get a little bit of an insight into her, the inner workings of her twisted little mind. A week later, Northwood's class, Dennis is now on vacation. Yep, he just went through with it. Faced with all of the consequences, losing his scholarship, losing his chance at Olympic, the Olympic dream, all the stuff that, you know, could affect his future negatively, he decided, you know what? I'll take the Bahama vacation over over all of that. That's the choice that Dennis makes here. Northwood's class, Dennis is gone, and Northwood is explaining to the class that he records his lectures in order so that he can listen to them later. And this is where, like, you kind of get the exposition that explains what his motivation is for having that tape recorder on all the time. Which is basically so that he'll remember everything that he ever said. It's kind of reasonable, I guess, as a teacher, like, to do that, maybe. Obviously, one of the kids in the class, because kids are brutal anyways. But one of the rich kids, Melody Dawson, makes a snide remark. And she says, why doesn't he just get a life? Who sits around and listens to themselves day after day like that right exactly northwood is obviously not happy with this remark so he tells her to stay after class and she's just like nope not gonna happen she just walks out of class yeah and he he wants to after her he wants her to stay after to get a lesson about decorum and (laughs) you know maybe write a hundred word essay about decorum or like right on the board i will not make fun of the teacher in class 
Like but ten yeah, times. that doesn't happen. Joanna and Margaret are talking about what happened in class while on the phone later that evening. They wish they could be rich. They're just like, wow, we wish we could just like go on a vacation to the Bahamas. In their world, rich is getting a dollar as a tip, a whole dollar. And that really lets you know the kind of lives they have. Right as they're talking about how Northwood is always singling out the rich kids for like punishment somehow, Joanna actually hears the sound of broken glass outside as we mentioned earlier, she actually lives next to Mr. Northwood, and as she looks out her window, she sees that the rich kids that didn't go to the Bahama vacation are actually kind of crouching down by Northwood's car on the street there, and they seem to be doing something, so she steps outside to investigate and see what this is all about. Lanny was dared to put sand in Northwood's gas tank, and he does it with great relish. Zach is carving Dennis's name into the car, and they're making so much noise that obviously Northwood is coming out to see what all the ruckus is, and the rich kids run away, and Joanna's just stuck. Yeah, she just loved holding the bag as Northwood calls the police. She makes up some fib about how she doesn't know what happened and didn't see anything. She was out there investigating the noise as well. Yep. The police don't actually take Northwood's call seriously. They arrive two hours later. And they don't do anything about it. Northwood talks to Mr. Hernandez, the principal, who we met in an earlier book, I believe, right? The new Ooh. boy. And he manages to get the four kids suspended. Obviously suspects it's the rich kids, and he's not wrong. Actually, it was the rich kids. They came over and they vandalized their teacher's car. Pretty bad. So they get suspended. You know? Northwood also believes Joanna's story about not knowing the rich kids and what happened. And he, you know, he says he believes her, but he's going to keep an eye on her. What happens is that night, Dennis calls Joanna to invite her to a party at Melody's on Friday. That's fine for her to go to a party with him because he and Caitlin are in an open relationship and it's no big deal. And she's going to be in Waynesbridge that night, so whatever. So we find out during that call that the rich kid's parents actually went to yell at Mr. Hernandez and they said all sorts of threatening things. The rich kids are allowed back in school. And the principal actually apologized for suspending them. You know, we kind of actually got a hint of this at the new boy. Remember when they step into the principal's office, he's on the phone with what sounds like some parent. It sounds like he's being threatened to like have some kind of like funds withdrawn or whatever from the school. And he's apologizing. And he's like saying, oh, don't worry. We'll make sure it never happens again. You know, so it really sounds like the school relies on like donations from rich people for like some of its programs. And Mr. Hernandez is willing to like bend over backwards for those people. And that seems to be the case, you know, in this book again. So Jana actually has this inner monologue about how there's obviously a stark difference between the rich people and poor people in Shadyside. So the next day in school, Dennis actually gives Joanna a shell from the Bahamas just as Caitlin is walking towards them. So at this point, Joanna once again has one of her weird fantasies. In this one, she smashes the shell into Caitlin's face, like just bloodies Caitlin's face with the shell. Blood, broken teeth, and just like... It's a mess. But in actuality, Dennis and Caitlin walk off to make out. I'm just picturing this. Caitlin walks up to Dennis and they both kind of look at Joanna as she's spaced out. Her eyes have this vacant stare as she's imagining all the shit that she's imagining. And they kind of just look at her strangely and shrug their shoulders and walk away. No, I don't think it's like that. Because you see it in shows. And you know, there's like the quirky shows where the person has like the violent fantasy, but like it only takes like a second of the time. Okay, well, I'm not an expert on violent fantasies. So that's what I, that's how I imagined it anyway. So Dennis is back and he's desperately trying to make up this midterm. Even though he had no reason to believe that this would be possible because Mr. Northwood was very clear. He didn't give him like even a glimmer of a hope that this could be a thing that happens. No makeup tests, no extra credit projects, no bending of the rules. And Dennis just keeps insisting to Northwood that like, you have to let me take this test. And Northwood has this great response of, you know, I don't have to do anything except pay taxes and die. <laughs> Suck it, rich boy. Yeah. Actually, like, this part of the book is incredible because going back to entitlement, right? Like, I'm pretty sure Dennis literally says, I am entitled to a makeup test or something very similar to that effect. And I was floored. I like, my jaw dropped and I was like, dang. This kid thinks he can just, like, get whatever he wants. He can get his Bahama vacation, and he can get his, you know, scholarship. Never mind that this teacher made it abundantly clear that he was not gonna, like, do that. 
Let's just think about Mr. Northwood. What about giving the kid an early test? He's not going to give him an early test because if he gives him the same exact test early, then he'll just tell all the other kids what the test is like. And why does Mr. Northwood have to spend the time and energy to make two separate tests just so this kid can go to the Bahamas? Obviously, Northwood is not going to do that. He's not paid to make two tests. He's paid to make one test. He's going to make one test. As far as a makeup test, again, he would have to make a second test because everybody's already taken the other test. He's not going to give the same exact test to Dennis. That would be stupid. Dennis could just cheat at that point. Northwood just doesn't want to make two tests. And that is completely reasonable. Why should Northwood have to make two separate midterm exams if all it is is this kid wants to go to the Bahamas when he could easily just stay behind and and not go to the Bahamas? He's old enough. He can take care of himself. He can stay at the house while the rest of his family goes to the Bahamas. It's no big deal. Why are his parents doing a Bahamas trip in the middle of February anyways? Because it doesn't matter. It's never mattered for them because they're rich. So if they're rich enough, they could just... You can't just buy a place on the Olympic team, right? If the kid gets enough, the kid gets enough. No, I'm saying, why don't they just schedule their vacation the next week? It seems like it would have been a lot easier for them to change his plane ticket to take that test than anything else. You know, maybe if he had actually talked to his parents about this and explained the situation, they could have probably rebooked it. You know, if they have a good travel agent or whatever, they could have had a very minimal rebooking fee, if any. You know, Southwest Airlines doesn't even charge for rebooking. So, you know, depending on what the arrangements were, it would have been simple enough to do that. I think it's understandable, but maybe he just didn't even bother talking to his parents and assumed everything would just work out in the end, the way it's always worked out in the end for him in all of these situations. Though I do have to say, I have taken makeup tests because I've been sick on exam days. I used to was a very sickly person. I just got the same test that everyone else got just a few days later. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. <laughs> There's a little bit of an element of like Mr. Northwood just hates these kids. We're on to Friday. It's date night. Joanna and Dennis are at Melody's party with a bunch of rich kids, including our favorite Reva Dalby. One of the snobbiest rich kids around, but we like her. We like how she's her own special brand of snobby. Snobby and snotty. Yeah. Anyways, during this party, the topic of conversation just turns into killing Mr. Northwood. They trade a lot of stories about how Mr. Northwood is just evil and he picks on them. What a bad guy he is. Boo hoo. And Dennis is really actually serious about killing him. Like he is no joke. Like, you know, straight face like, I will kill him. It's a little bit disturbing. Well, speaking of disturbing, Dennis drives Joanna home and they're making out in front of her house. And hey, Mr. Northwood is watching them make out. That kind of kills their mood. This is where it gets disturbing to me. Joanna is enraged that Northwood would spy on them and that has apparently ruined her night. So she goes into her house, pulls out the pistol her father left behind for protection and aims it at Mr. Northwood, who's still standing on his front lawn. And just pulls the trigger. And luckily for her, it's not loaded. What the heck? Yeah, I'm not even sure if this is like a real thing or like one of her fantasies. But if this is her little violent fantasy bleeding over into real life, she's dang freaking lucky that that thing wasn't loaded. Like, you do not play with guns like that. You don't pick up a gun and just start aiming it at things like that. This is beyond any kind of gun safety. If you pick up the weapon, first of all, you're pointing it away from anybody. You're pointing it down and you have to check if it's loaded before you do anything else. And then even if you've done that and you've checked that it's not loaded, you're certainly not going to be aiming it willy-nilly unless you actually expect to shoot something. You're not going to be aiming it at that. And clearly, she hasn't received any kind of gun safety education of any kind. Typical Fear Street kids. School happens, and Dennis asks to hang out with Joanna later. Ooh, things are heating up, huh? Oh, except he shows up, and he has his entire squad with him. Went from a date to a group hangout, which is, you know, whatever. And they end up talking about their favorite subject. Yes, Northwood. They've got it in for Northwood. He's got it in for them. It's just like a big old feud, isn't it? Well, Zach got caught cheating on a quiz. That's very unHamilton-like. His ancestor would not approve. You know, they think that he has it in for the rich kids because you know, you know, why is he always catching us cheating? You know, that's not fair. <laughs> what? So since Northwood is right next door, they might as well get some revenge. And it just so happens, Zach has a vial of skunk juice or skunk scent on Which, him. By the way, where do you even get that? He said he got it from the local college. Where do you even get that? <laughs> in like, I would say in like a biochem lab or... So you took biochem, right? We didn't make skunk juice or skunk scent. Right. 
Well, you figure like maybe he has a relative or I think it was his brother that's in college. And maybe he works in a lab that deals with skunk scent. It's a thing. Mm. I mean, I assume there's experiments going on just figuring out the chemical properties of it or anything. I mean, it, I'm not going to nitpick that. <laughs> there's some weird things in labs. I'm not officially nitpicking it. I guess I'm just questioning, poking at it. I'm poking at it a little bit questioningly. Anyway, so he's got this vial and they all just start daring each other to do it. And Joanna goes... I will take the vio next door. Though I do not know the way. Uh, she's desperately trying to fit in here. You know, she's not like trying to be like heroic or anything. This is just her thinking that, you know, she, she can score a little bit of points here and like try to solidify her place in the group because she really wants to be with Dennis and she wants to impress him. Dennis is crazy. So she figures if I do crazy stuff, you know, I'll impress him. So anyway, she takes the vial. She goes over to Northwood's house and she like actually does it. She goes through with it. She like breaks it right on the porch. It it works. She runs away. Northwood comes out like, what the heck is this smell? They all laugh about it and they go to the corner to hang out and talk about their escapades. When Joanna is dropped off back at home, Marb is there to confront her. They were supposed to work on a science project together and Joanna actually canceled their hangout claiming that she had the flu. Yeah, and Marb brought her soup. Oh my god, is she not, like, the best friend ever? Like, did you have a a friend in high school that would literally come to your house and bring you soup if you were sick? I had a friend get me bubble tea, and then I had a friend give me the cutest teddy bear ever that I still have. I wish I had a friend like that in high school. Like, it's it's like that song. You don't know what you had till it's gone, right? So you know, they have... Marb gets eaten by the Demi-Gorgon. And know. that's the end of Marb. She's in the Upside Down. And yep. Anyways, uh, they have an argument. And Marb actually warns Joanna that the rich kids are obviously using her for something. That she needs to watch out. Like, she's just being so simple. Like, why can't she see that the rich kids are up to something? Yeah, to the rich kids... Joanna is nothing more than a Slurpee to play with and then splash upon the floor and walk away and pay whoever needs to be paid off to ignore the mess. And Marb can see this and Joanna is blinded by her obsession with Dennis. This is pretty much a friendship ending argument right there. Joanna is just upset that Marb won't see what she sees in these people. And Marb is upset that Joanna is just being willfully ignorant. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink, right? Like, there's only so much that Marb can do in this situation. It has been a few weeks and Joanna is now fully a part of the rich kid clique. Guess what they're still obsessed with? They're still hating Northwood, and he's failed both Zach and Dennis, and so Dennis is kicked off the track team, as he had easily anticipated that this would happen if he wasn't able to take the midterm, and guess what? He was promised he wouldn't be able to take the midterm, and this exact thing happened, and not even the rich parents could convince the principal to somehow turn a blind eye to a big, glaring F-bomb on his report card. Caitlin and Melody have had weeks worth of after-school detention, and they all might lose their spring break trip privileges. (laughs) Maybe if you don't mouth off to the teacher and ignore him and make fun of him in the middle of class, you wouldn't get all those detentions. How about that? Or vandalize his car. Forgot about that one. Well, that's what entitlement is, right? (sighs) Anyways, they're all hanging out at Joanna's house, and guess what Dennis finds? He finds the gun that is still in that same exact spot in, like, a little drawer in the living room. So he loads it with bullets because, okay, whatever. I don't even understand at this point. And then (sighs) the boys play pretend shooting with the gun, and the girls are just like, please stop, this is really stupid, you need to put it away. As they're playing cowboy, guess what happens? Somebody's accidentally shot. Hilariously, it's the Hamilton in the group. (laughs) You know what? I didn't actually catch that. That's a nice observation. Listen, he put on his glasses. Oh, yeah, that's true. And he's always wearing glasses. That's funny. No, um, he gets shot in the shoulder, though, instead of in the gut. And so it's just a flesh wound. Getting shot in the shoulder is more than a flesh wound. Well, Jeez. Yeah. Anyways, everyone else... He might is... have, like, nicked an artery, though, because there's a lot of blood. It doesn't look good. Like, I think he passes out, right? So everyone is freaking out. Dennis gets someone to call 911. Then he orders someone to clean up the blood. And then... This is bizarre. Unlike normal people who would, you know, put pressure on the wound and, like, keep him, you know, conscious and take care of him, whatever. Right, and Zach is bleeding out and losing consciousness. He drags Zach onto Northwood's lawn, puts the pistol on the porch in this bizarre attempt to frame Northwood for the shooting. Obviously, this is some real BS, and everyone sees right through this. The cops come, and they're just like... They, yeah, did they, you really think we're that stupid? They, they get it right away, but because it's all the rich kids, 
It doesn't even make the police blotter. It's all covered up. Yeah, the parents just show up at the police station and, you know, they talk to the cops and whatever. Well, now, the- do you want to ruin these young kids' bright futures with, like, a, a criminal record? The rich parents were not able to use any sway or whatever powers of persuasion in getting their kids transferred out of Northwood's class. And if they were just paranoid about him being biased against them, he is now officially biased well yeah they try to frame him for freaking murder <laughs> well he didn't die oh attempted murder i guess jesus he just gives them just just them just that group mountains of papers to do and homework and fails them for little things on quizzes and tests i mean they had it coming at that point i do think like those kids probably should have been transferred out of his class i don't know <laughs> i'm not entirely sure i agree with that choice but transferred out of his class Probably Mr. Hernandez can just suspend them from school for attempting to frame a teacher with murder, right? But he's not allowed to suspend them. Joanna's mom disapproves of her new friends. And yeah, because just... the cops showed up and somebody got shot in her living room. Yes, and they tried to frame a teacher. Don't forget that. And she basically forbids Joanna from hanging out with those new kids. And oh my god, we've all been teenagers. That does not happen. Oh, those kids are a bad influence. Don't hang out with them. You you need to find some nice friends, right? You know, we've all had that. Whatever happened to Marb? (laughs) I liked Marb. She was a sweet girl. She's at the bottom of a swimming pool in the Upside Down. That's what happened to her. Anyway, so her mom locks the gun in the bottom drawer of the same desk. (sighs) Okay, gun safety. Yeah. So a few weeks go by and Dennis and Joanna are kind of a couple. And they're making out at River Ridge, the makeout spot. But guess what Dennis is talking about to set the mood. Yeah, he's still completely freaking obsessed with Northwood. Joanna is more into Dennis than she's ever been before because of how he took charge after shooting Zack. He was so quick thinking and, you know, he just came up with this plan to frame Northwood right on the spot. He's perfect. This is one of the most bizarre, supposedly sympathetic protagonist we've had it's hilarious and i i was laughing my ass off when i read that like what girl come on i know she's like i don't know if it's because she's so obsessed with dennis that she sees like every feature of him as like a good quality or if it's her like messed up internal life that is just bleeding out into the world around her and like twisting her perception of reality or maybe little column a you know little column b por que no los dos it's bizarre and hilarious and i am here for this girl (laughs) um dennis dares joanna to kill northwood on saturday and she accepts Yep, everything has come to a head here. We've got the dare. The dare is now on the table. This is the, you know, the eponymous dare right here. So in school for this whole week, people are wishing Joanna luck to complete her dare. And Marb actually pulls Joanna aside and tells her that this is a friggin' awful idea. That her new friends are awful and this is awful and just don't do it because what is wrong with you? This is awful. But, you know, Joanna just likes being the school celebrity and all the attention she's getting, she finally feels like, you know, she has risen above that base poverty that she was in. And she's like now floating up towards the upper crust of the school's social hierarchy. And she's just like loving the limelight. People are actually making bets. Yeah, and the pot is over a thousand bucks. This is not the first time where somebody has gotten killed or could possibly be killed over a lowball four-figure sum of money. I mean, let's go back to the other Mr. Hernandez Fear Street novel, The New Boy, where we have some murdering going on and it's all about like $3,000 at most, maybe not even. This is like the same freaking situation again. Like, who cares how much the pot is for whether she does it or not? You're going to jail anyways, girl. (laughs) It's like a person's life. Over what? Over, he has done nothing wrong. I just... We'll talk about this later, but okay, anyways. So Joanna ends up skipping school later in the week because she's just actually getting nervous from all this attention. She sees Northwood outside moving his firewood around in his yard, and she has this other fantasy where she gruesomely kills Mr. Northwood by smashing his face in with the logs. And when I say gruesome, I mean it. Like This is like described in all of the detail. Instead, in real life... She picks the lock of the drawer because 
duh. And she grabs the gun, and she takes the gun out to go shoot Mr. Northwood. But she's interrupted by Marb, who has come to talk to Joanna in this kind-hearted attempt to talk her out of the dare. And this is good on her. Marb is so freaking kind-hearted and such a good friend. Anybody else would have just given up on Joanna by now. And, you know, Margaret is still there for her, and it's just, it's so nice. Joanna is convinced that Marb just doesn't understand the special bond between herself and Dennis. <sighs> Saturday is here, and Joanna's got the gun ready to go, but she's a bit nervous. North was making it real easy for her. He's outside painting the shed, and Dennis shows up, and he's equally nervous. He can't wait for her to do it. They're just bundles of nerves, and Joanna runs to the bathroom because she's so nervous she needs to calm her nerves, and she gets Dennis to hold the gun for her. And then she's trying not to vomit while, like, you know, settling her stomach in the bathroom. There's, like, this sound like a car backfire outside, and that kind of, like, snaps her out of it. So she heads out of the bathroom. She notices that Northwood is kind of just leaning on his wood pile. Kind of similar to that fantasy she had before. But he's kind of just like not moving. And as Joanna gets closer and closer while holding the gun, she realizes that she can't do it. She can't go through with it and kill him. But he's kind of like just not moving. He's kind of just limply draped on the wood pile there. So she gets closer and she's calling out to him like Mr. Northwood. And then she realizes that he's been shot. There's some blood. And at this point, we get Dennis running over to congratulate Joanna on a job well done. Congratulations, you have gone through with the dare. I knew you could do it. Joanna's just denying it. I didn't do it. And Dennis is just insisting like, yes, you did. Congrats. Yeah, check the gun. It smells of gunpowder and it's been fired recently. And don't worry, I've called the police already and they're on the way. I swear I'll tell them it was self-defense. Caitlin arrives on the scene, and Dennis reveals the entire actual plan. Yes, the next level plan. What happened, actually, is Caitlin dared him to ask Joanna to kill Northwood. So this is, like, the actual dare. It's like a dare hierarchy. There's the dare, and then there's, like, the sub-dare. It's like a meta-dare, almost. They've been stringing her along the entire time, and they've set up the motive and everything. They just want to frame her for the murder. Joanna, at this point, fantasizes about shooting the two of them. The police arrive, and Dennis and Kaylin are putting on quite the show. And you know what? They're going to arrest Joanna for first-degree murder. But Dennis and Kaylin are, I mean, like the crocodile tears. I mean, this is like the... We tried to stop her. Oh, she didn't know what she was doing. She was so angry. <laughs> we couldn't get the gun away from her. Boo-hoo. Oh, well, oh. surprise, surprise, surprise to everyone, because no one knows how to check a pulse. Yep, Northwood's alive. But now the police are like, well, you know, we can still get her for intent to kill an assault with a deadly weapon. Which, by the way, do, like, the arresting officers ever talk about, like, what crime you're going to be charged with? Like, I'm pretty sure, like, when there's a murder, like, they're too busy calling EMS and just bundling you into the car in handcuffs, and that's about it. But, like, whatever. Everybody's just apparently standing around watching this man bleed to death. One of the cops actually finds a recorder in Northwood's pocket, and it's been recording the entire time. Dun, dun, dun. Plot. Uh, point. Yeah, you don't need, like, to be Sherlock Holmes to figure this one out at this point because it's all on tape. The police officer stops the recording, rewinds, and then pushes play. And guess what? The gig is up. Yeah, the entire confession is taped. The actual murder is taped. Maybe the actual murder, but the definitely the confession is taped. Dennis just spells everything out. He and Caitlin plan this whole thing out to frame Joanna, and suddenly... The police are going to arrest Dennis and Caitlin for assault and intent to kill. Yeah, their little crocodile tears dry up and they are no longer smug. The real waterworks come out as they realize that they are completely royally screwed. The police are going to come back to get Joanna's statement and Joanna just hurries back into her house seemingly okay with all that happened. Yeah, and I'm assuming, you know, they're wiping Dennis's hands for gunshot residue and bundling him off in handcuffs and possibly bumping his head on the door of the car as they, like, shove him in there. And I don't think, I don't think his parents are going to be able to talk them out of this one. This is pretty bad. He's That's got the... the affluenza defense, right? That's true. Listen, he had so much going for him, and that's the end of the book. And now, a word from our sponsors. I told you to take it. <sighs> Whatever. You never said that. Yes, I did. I literally said it like five minutes ago. I was listening the whole freaking time. You didn't say a freaking word. I was talking to you for like forever before, and I told you to do it. I reminded you the <sighs> day before. I kept reminding you. Oh, my it's almost as if you don't listen to it. 
I'm sick. You know what? I wish I had a freaking tape recorder so I could prove how right I was. Are you tired of forgetting the exact wording of what everyone around you says? Don't you wish there was a reliable record of your conversations throughout the day that you could go through later? Ever get in an argument about what someone said and wish you could go back and listen? Fear not. We have just the thing for you. Portable recorders on sale now. Starting at 1994 at Dolby's department store. Dolby Digital, Dolby Quality. Fear Street Mythos. At one point, Joanna's mother is visiting Joanna's aunt in Cleveland. Back to Ohio. We were talking about this earlier that probably Fear Street, Shadyside are in Ohio. You know, we're kind of getting that again because you always hear like, oh, you know, somebody's in Cleveland or Capital City definitely sounds like Columbus. So this is definitely like the shady side A side for sure. As far as Fear Street mythos, what we have is Joanna's character. That's kind of all we have to go on. She is one of the stranger leads that we've had. She's got like some mental issues. She probably needs to see a therapist. I assume her mom can't afford to get her a therapist and is maybe not even present enough to realize that her daughter needs this help. With how wealthy the North Hills is, I think Shadyside is probably like a booming district in terms of like the school. Like they should have a psychologist in the school. There there are a few see- characters, even in Broken Hearts, they didn't have like a psychologist for the students. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. Or, you know, how one. about in the cheerleader saga where like people kept dying left and right. I feel like that's like a- students were dropping dead. And usually, like, counseling is available to the students when their classmates die like that. Kids die so often in this district. They're just like, we don't need counseling services. <laughs> like, just forget it. No, they should have, like, a lot of counseling staff at this school. But, yeah, so she doesn't get the help she needs. You know, there's a lot of reasonable ways you, you can rationalize why she's having these problems, right? The recent divorce of her mother could be a reason that she's having these episodes. It's understandable if the divorce could be very traumatic for the child. And, you know, it could cause an onset of this kind of thing. These kinds of weird fantasies, these weird episodes where you kind of have these violent things play out in your brain. That's understandable. The fact that her mother is not really there for her, you know, that could be stressful for the child as well. The situation where maybe she's just frustrated about her lot in life. You know, she's not one of the cool kids. She doesn't have a lot of money. She She's not able to afford the designer clothes. She can't have any of those finer things. Like, she could work all the after-school jobs she wants, but she's not going to be able to get all that stuff. It could be frustrating, maybe. I mean, we're deviating a bit from Fear Street Mythos, but one thing I want to say is when you were talking about how, like, she's frustrated with her lot in life, in the first part of she went to, the one where Riva was there, One of the rich kids at the party asks her, Oh, aren't you Margaret's friend? She's a really cool girl. She's really funny. You know, that made me think for a while. And I was thinking about how, first of all, you know, Joanna was really lucky to have Marv as a friend. But the fact that those kids knew her friend and saw her friend as like a cool kid in her own right. Right. It's one of those grass is greener on the other side things. It's one of those. She had like a great friend that had a great personality that had just so much going for her that wasn't money. And Joanna had that person as her friend and she just like... She squandered that. She she pissed all of that away. That struck me because I was like, you know, R.L. Stein wrote that for a reason. I mean, maybe he didn't. I don't know. <laughs> but I feel like Maybe he did. Let's just assume he's a great author. And this was like one of the moments where his great authorship showed Sure. that at this party where she's finally invited by Dennis to like this rich kid party. It's her first like coming out thing. And someone goes, oh, yeah, you're that girl's friend. You're Margaret's friend. She's really funny. She's really cool. Like, oh, that's interesting. That's the other thing, right? This is going back to her, how she's kind of like mousy, according to um, herself. She's a little bit shy. Why not, if you got, like, this cool invite to the rich kid party, why not be like, hey, I'm going to bring my friend Margaret. That's okay, right? What's the worst that's going to happen? That's actually what happened in Stranger Things. Right. I, no, I understand. It I didn't like end that, well for Margaret. I know, but, like, that's the cool thing to do. If you have, like, your best friend, you score the invite to, like, the rich kid party, you go, like, oh, yeah, I want to bring my friend. Like, what's going to happen? Are they going to disinvite you because you want to bring your friend? No. They're going to be like, yeah, sure, she can come. She wanted to go on this, like, kind of date with this guy she didn't want. But it is one of those things it tells you. I think that informs you. I think mm-hmm. that informs the reader. I mean, this is obviously not Fear Street Myth. This is the point. But I feel like that informs the reader so much about Joanna's character. First of all, that 
her friend is already known within this cool kid, rich kid group. Yeah. But also that she didn't think, I think it'd be nice to have my homegirl here with me. Right. Yeah, it doesn't It doesn't reflect well on her, does it? She already has fantasies about, like, killing people. That's... <laughs> <laughs> A lot of things already didn't reflect well on her. Yeah. We could maybe say that Fear Street is what caused her to kind of like go crazy, but she ends up like not really doing anything really bad. I wouldn't call her crazy. Let's not throw that word around. Yeah. I mean, she did. It was she's one of those people that grew up on Fear Street, right? If anything, Dennis is the one that might be more of the candidate for somebody that's influenced by Fear Street. So we talked about already how maybe like on Fear Street, the concentration of the mineral being stronger in that area because it's close to like where the mother load is buried. As the pipes that run water to the houses go through that area, they can like maybe absorb some of that essence. Since all the rich kids keep coming over to Joanna's house to hang out, suddenly this new enhanced surge of whatever is causing them to like act out really crazy. But all of Shady Side is, we've already figured out, is subject to that. And they should be mostly immune. None of them are new kids. They already get a lot of it at school. Because we know they dose the kids at school with that stuff as part of like a weird top secret experiment. So I'm not really sure any of this is really future mythos. And I almost feel like that's not the point of this book. This book is more about kind of like a psychological study of the character. Well, why don't we go through callbacks and 90s things and nitpicks before we like really, really get into this book? Callbacks, we have a lot of returning characters, starting with our favorite, Riva Dalby, who will always have a very special place in all of our hearts. I think we gave her books probably like the highest ratings of any of the Fear Street books, and with good reason. We also have Dina Martinson. We yeah. have Suki Thomas. Of course. I mean, that's a classic Fear Street character. Well, that right t- tells us like we're still in that time loop because Suki should definitely not be here at this point. And um, Mr. Hernandez, I think he's kind of like getting his own little vibe here because in both of his appearances on Fear Street, we are getting that whole issue where what kind of influence on the school do these rich donors have? That's kind of like, that's been brought up again now with this book that got brought up the first time in New Boy. And now we're kind of thinking like, okay, does this almost have like a private school kind of thing going on where they're relying on donations from alumni and stuff like that. So there's definitely that element that he brings to the story that comes with him every time that he appears. You mentioned that the celebrity references come back and there's a celebrity reference for Mr. Northwood. Correct, yes. He's described as looking like... A beardless Abe Lincoln or Clint Eastwood on a bad day. So I had to Google Abe Lincoln without a beard (laughs) and also what Clint Eastwood looked like in the 90s. Is there actually a photograph of Abe Lincoln without a beard? Yes, there are. Whoa, he like shaved at some point? No, wait, did he really? Okay, so Anna is rotating the uh, computer screen towards me and indeed he was clean shaven. Yeah, so I can totally picture... He looks better with a beard, by the way. So I wanted to know what Clint Eastwood looked like in the 90s. Because I know what he looks like. You know, I've seen Gran Torino. And that was like the aughts. I've seen clips of the movies he's really well known for. But that was like God knows when. So not the 90s specifically. And yeah, I I can totally picture what Northwood looked like. And I just want to throw in like, I still kind of pictured him like Mr. Apple. What's, What's Mr. Apple's name? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. In terms of 90s things, we got Trapper Keepers. Yeah, Trapper Keepers, I think, were mentioned in an earlier book, and now they're back again. Apparently, they're still around, so maybe not so much 90s things. Well, they were from the 80s, actually. They were really, really big in the 80s, and Mr. Northwood's tape recorder. No one really uses a tape recorder anymore. That's not a thing. You can record straight to MP3 on, like, a little digital recorder, and that's usually what people have. I think most people have their smartphones. Okay, yes. I even have an app on a smartphone to record, although that's not surprising considering that I am part of a podcast. Okay, so this is... I wrote this as a 90s thing. Is lack of forensics knowledge considered a 90s thing? Because I feel like I watched a lot of CSI, which came out like in the, what, late 90s? Mm -hmm. Or early 2000s? I'm not sure. I think I've... I know an okay amount about, like, basic forensics. But before we had things like this, did people know about gunshot residue and the most basic things ever? Like, why his stupid framing plan would not work? I can only speak for myself here. I know that I took a wilderness first responder course, which is basically, um, like, a first responder certification. You have to know, like, a lot of first aid beyond like basic first aid up to like a couple levels up from that prior to taking that certification i had no freaking clue about how to stop bleeding how to check for life signs 
how to keep somebody stable, like none of that. I just did not know it. So for me personally, like without taking a week long certification course, like in an immersive environment, I would have no freaking clue about any of that stuff. To me, now, being where I am today, I'm like, oh, 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 these simple kids, don't they know the basics? But it's only the basics to me because I took that class. Otherwise, I would have no freaking clue. I guess you, it depends on the type of person because like, I grew up watching a ton of ER and I loved watching like medical things and obviously studied a lot of medical things and reading a lot of medical things and also like forensics things. I was a weirdo. So I guess maybe it's just a me thing and not a 90s thing. Yeah, I don't know. In like it's hard to say thing. for me. I also didn't watch that much TV in the 90s so I don't even know. Like maybe there was a show that could have taught me things. Maybe there wasn't and it appeared later on in the aughts but I didn't really watch TV in the aughts either so I don't have like a point of reference to compare. Sorry, I'm, like, not the right person to debate ER this on. ER was such a great show, though. Jesus. <laughs> Wasn't that a terrible show? Wasn't it more like a soap opera than, ER? like, a real show? Yeah. ER at the beginning was, like, amazing. It it actually made me want to be an emergency room doctor until I went to do stuff in an emergency room. And I was like, this is very high-paced and insane, and I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> but, I don't know. 24 on, 24 off. Sounds like a good good deal anyways. Nitpicks. This was my nitpick. I mean, there's a lot of nitpicks to have, but this is an actual just pure nitpick and no discussion, but I think it'll lead to discussion. Why is Zach still friends with a guy who shot him and didn't give him any medical treatment and said used him as a pawn in like this insane game against Northwood? Is Zach really still friends with Dennis at this point, though? We never really see them hanging out afterwards being like all pals and stuff, do we? They jump to two weeks later when he dares Joanna to shoot Northwood and all that. So it seems like Zach is still in recovery, but they don't really... The way they talk about it, they don't really say like, and Zach was very angry at them. They just... Right. Well, here's the other point, right? More to your point. Yes, Zach should be very mad at Dennis, obviously. But what about all of their mutual friends, right? Joanna has this really weird reaction where she's, like, impressed by Dennis taking charge of the situation and going the batshit crazy route, basically living out her inner fantasies IRL. But what about their other friends? Like, what about Caitlin, who's still with Dennis? Why is she still with this crazy psychopath? Well, it seems like Melody was the one who had the greatest reaction. She was, like, vomiting all over the place. <laughs> she was, like, disgusted. And she was the one that, like, wanted to leave and was crying and was right. hysterical, which... Normal. It's a normal, normal response. Normal. Completely normal, right? It, that was the only normal reaction that entire night. Well, I think all the girls were telling him to stop. Caitlin. All the girls were telling them to stop, but why are you still with the person who did the that, exactly. not? The whole friend group sticking by him after what he did, and then the entire school not talking about what a crazy psycho he might be. That's what I don't get. You're I right, mean, that is a, like a real legit nitpick, because that's like a friend group like breaking apart sort of like situation. You shot our friend! And How instead could you of do doing that? any sort of basic first aid, yeah. he just he could have died. dragged him over, threw him on the lawn, threw the gun there, and ran away. Yeah, like, how bad must they all hate Northwood if losing one of their crew is like an acceptable sacrifice to bring him down? Do they have any sense of perspective whatsoever? Or is his family the richest and they just do what he does? Because Caitlin's dad was the banker, right? I, I don't even know. That's the only reason Draco Malfoy has friends in Harry Potter, because his family is so rich and so well regarded. Otherwise, he's just a sniveling little idiot. Right. Like, is that a... why they're friends with Dennis? Because he's so rich? That's a pretty good analogy, I guess, yeah. The other thing that I noticed was that the entire book is completely from Joanna's point of view. There is no... Sometimes Arl Stein will throw in like a couple of chapters from another person's point of view. Sometimes there'll be just a little bit of omniscient narrator. The whole thing is Joanna's narrative. Literally as if she is sitting there telling the story of what happened. Yeah, it's all in first person. It's like literally as if somebody was like telling you the story. They're sitting right there and they're just telling you like everything that's relevant to the story. And as the story unfolds, you begin to realize what everything is relevant to. Everything is relevant to what happens between Northwood and the rich kids. Every little scene, every incident ties back to that. What is the relationship between Northwood and the rich kids? How is it that Joanna came to find out what this relationship was? So my little theory here is that this could be just a tape recording of her statement to the police. She's sitting down in the room, and there's a detective sitting across from her, and she's telling her story. This is like every relevant fact to the case of how these kids came to like hate Northwood and had the motive to go ahead and kill him. It all makes sense until you realize, like, she's also telling you all her 
really bizarre fantasies of like smashing people's face in. No one's going to be saying that stuff in a police report. Except for the girl that thinks that somebody taking charge of the situation and trying to frame somebody is cool. She's clearly still going through a lot of issues. And the fact that she just witnessed her teacher nearly die in front of her own eyes and almost got framed for it. If you think her parents' divorce and like her mom being away from home like affected her to the point where she's like hallucinating these weird fantasies, can you imagine what the incidents of the last few weeks have done to her mental state? She's probably not in a place where she can make that kind of judgment call of like, I don't tell the police certain things. I'm just throwing it out there. It could still be this. Uh, I don't really buy it, but I think the big thing about this book is i mean you mentioned earlier that it's a very like psychological it's like a profile of a psychological personality and what (laughs) i was just thinking about this and this often happens during this podcast right we have a big discussion we talk about the plot we talk about this and that and i come to a realization i just had this just dawned upon me that this is arl stein's take on crime and punishment we have this poor character that is destitute that is barely getting by that they have money troubles they have maybe one friend they can rely upon and they have these weird fantasies inside their head these like illusions of grandeur there's a murder it's kind of like that but you know it's with a twist right he wasn't gonna like exactly copy it and so the, the twist is that it's actually much like crime and punishment it's still a commentary on the rich versus poor the social structures and how those with the advantages of money and social class can survive through things that those that don't have that are not able to get through life as easily it's still got all of that going on but now we bring in an extra element of the actual rich people or like one of them is actually like the bad guy do you see the parallel here i I kind of see that that there's like a little bit of a crime and punishment element going on here like with joanna being kind of almost a raskolnikov sort of character see i saw i mean obviously crime and punishment is like one of your favorite books so it does make sense you jump there i was actually just comparing it to gomor girls because i feel like that rich kid clique of theirs very much like the life and death brigade and dennis is like a sociopathic logan huntsberger because while logan had his issues He was not a dentist. But Joanna seemed like a more malleable Rory Gilmore in that she was being just swept away by these like rich kids and their lifestyle and like everything they could do and everything they had to offer and everything they had in life. She just seemed like taken in by it. And the scene where they're just like making that huge mess in the 7-Eleven with the squishies and then you just like throw a wad of money. I mean, that happened in Gilmore Girls. Mm-hmm. There's a scene that where they, they make a huge mess in a store and they just throw money everywhere and go, yep, that should cover it. And that just struck me as like, oh, is that like a very rich person thing to do? Like, <laughs> I don't think so. That's the thing. Like, I, I'm not sure that like people really do that kind of stuff. I mean, that's like making a big mess in a 7-Eleven. That's just like a normal teenager thing to do, I guess. I feel like that scene was just a way to set them up. He like really hit this idea of privilege over the head, right? He just like really drove home that these kids feel like they are entitled to everything. They deserve whatever they want. And if anybody stands in their way, like Mr. Northwood doesn't give them every minute little thing that they ask for. Well, how dare he? I ask nicely and I deserve this, right? That's their reaction. Right. I mean, yes, they're hammering in that they are rich and this is how they get away. They get away with everything. They think they can get away with everything as long as they have enough money. It would just like, it just reminded me of that scene from Gilmore Girls. And in a way, Dennis was just like a lower brow Logan Huntsberger. Because I'm looking at this quote when Logan first introduces Rory to the Life and Death Brigade. Mm-hmm. She's covering their like stupid shindig for the newspaper, for the Yale Daily Prophet or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He's like... Read a skeeter and he's trying to convince her to do that like massive jump and she was just like no i don't want to do it this looks really scary like i'm just here to cover it and he's like convincing her to do it and you know he says it'll be fun it'll be a thrill something stupid something bad for you just something different isn't this the point of being young it's your choice people can live a hundred years without really living for a minute you can climb up here with me it's one less minute you haven't lived I mean, that's a very, he was a very well-spoken kid, but there is an element of that with these kids, with their dares. Yes. Yes, although they're not so well-spoken, not so eloquent, and single-mindedly 
one track obsessed with Northwood. Like, they didn't always just ties right back to Northwood with these guys. I mean, like, dang. Don't they have anything else going on in their lives than, like, hating on this one teacher? Honestly. These kids are so bizarre. But no, my point with that quote is, like, you know, rich kid basically makes a proposition to someone who's Mm -hmm. considered timid and mousy and shy. Yes. Drawing them in with their charisma and, like, everything they can have. And, you know, I I saw a lot of similarities there, except... I see what you're saying. I definitely, definitely seeing this aspect of it. But you have to go back to... Crime and Punishment. Crime and Punishment. And and the fact that... Well, I think the difference between Joanna and Raskolnikov is that Raskolnikov had like... I think in the end, Joanna did end up being a better person than him. In the end, Raskolnikov is redeemed, right? Is he though? Yeah, he's sent to like a labor camp that, where he like realizes the wrongs of his ways through hard labor. But that was after he did it. See, Joanna sure. didn't need the hard labor. <laughs> See, Joanna, like before she even pulled the trigger, was like, I can't do this. This is really stupid. She was really drawn in until the last minute where like sense kicked in. And sure. she was like, no. Well, yeah, but I mean, that's typical for Arl Stein's female characters where in the end reason triumphs out for them usually but I think those elements of her internal struggle the, the, the weird fantasies she keeps having obviously like a little bit of a mental unbalance and if you think about Raskolnikov's character too a lot of his like mental instability stems from the fact that he is so poor that he keeps having to write home for them to send him more money and he's like so ashamed to have to do this because his family is not very well off and I think his father is like out of the picture also and it pains him so much and and he has to do it and and he doesn't want to do it anymore and it like drives him crazy and he ends up having these like insane thoughts and it's kind of like goes back to her where her father's out of the picture. She doesn't have any money. She sees the rich people around her getting away with everything. And instead of like Why treasuring what she has, right. she like goes out to find something, some meaningful thing that you know, tries to grasp onto something that is out of her reach, you know? Yeah, I see that too. And and this is a compliment to R.L. Stein because here he has written a fascinating character in Joanna. I mean, there's a lot of class struggle things that he's put in here. There's a lot of like psychological, there's a lot to analyze. Yeah, just, I mean, just the mere fact that here I am like comparing this to one of my favorite novels. You know, obviously he hit upon something here, definitely. Her character is very unique. I would say she's up there with Riva Dalby in terms of like, Just like a striking character that just stands there. I would disagree completely. I think as a character, she's very milquetoast. I would say that the way that the story was put out and that how she fits into the story is interesting. But I think she as a character is very boring. Whereas Riva's stories are kind of run of the mill, (laughs) but Riva herself is what elevates the stories. Yeah. I don't think the story is elevated by Joanna. No, that's true. Yeah. Riva's stories are silly capers. And she stands out in those as, like, some kind of, like, shining beacon. I mean, I would say that the fact that you can never remember her name, Joanna's name, <laughs> is just a prime example of how, like, yeah. you cannot I don't know if you're going to her... edit this out or not, but, uh, yeah, I am struggling to remember her name throughout the this entire episode. But, on the other hand, her personality is memorable, even though her name may not be, in that she keeps having these freaking episodes... And, and the way the narrative is written completely as her telling the story, like, I did this, and then I saw this, and then I saw them do that, and then her inner thoughts, and then I thought this about the, them doing this. Well, that like is a unique way that he has not written any other books, really, I feel in like this way. I've, I've seen movies and shows where that have, you know, the thing happens, and then the one character, like, punches the other one, and then it, like, rewinds, and it's like, oh, actually, that didn't happen. This is what actually yes. happened. I feel like this is the only way R.L. Stein could figure how to write one of those type of stories. You're right. If Because you can't it, do that in third person. Yeah. And this is the only way where it's from that person's point of view. I think this way of writing the book seems to suit his style more. And it came out more authentic, more genuine, less humdrum. Here I am just shitting out another crappy novel like in three weeks to get my paycheck well i think it felt more inspired but i think the issue with that weird fantasy thing is that he did it as the end of the chapter thing (laughs) way too many times it was a little gimmicky right it was a gimmick like he's like oh and then i bashed her face and threw her out and i smiled triumphantly right the first time it happens you kind of like fall for it and then every time thereafter you're like oh 
Uh-huh. Yeah. I think what really strikes this book as unique for me is how well he portrayed the class divide. There's the thing where Dennis is going on vacation to the Bahamas. It's not even spring break. It's the middle of February. His family, they're just going to the Bahamas. That's an intense vacation. You know, there was a Reddit thread recently that was like, what's something that poor people do that, you know, most people don't even realize is a poor person thing? And one of the top answers was instead of going on vacations to exciting places you're going on vacations to visit family and joanna has this inner thought where you know she goes the only vacations we ever go on is to visit our aunt in cleveland he didn't even have to really spell it out it's like dennis is going to the bahamas joanna's vacations are cleveland to visit um, her aunt yes yep and even the thing with when she's on the phone with marb and they're talking about you know oh it must be really nice to be rich and how their idea of rich is getting a whole dollar for a tip. This is a recurring theme with Arlstein, uh, the sort of the class struggle going on. I think the most striking moment for me in the Fear Street series in terms of this was when in Haunted, you get the description of the boy's room and just the sparseness of it. There's like one desk that's built into the wall and there is one trash bin and there's like a crappy little bed in a corner and that's it there's no other furnishings there's nothing it's just empty and his dad's not home because he's out you know drinking at the bar you know with the two dollar dilly dilly special and it's just like that scene is just stuck with me where you see what his surroundings are what his day-to-day is and how just destitute and empty and hopeless it is and that's something that Arlstein seems to have tapped into again with this book where he shows that stark contrast He does, like, really go overboard vilifying the rich kids, I think. Well, that's his thing, right? If you're too poor, you are having weird fantasies and twisted thoughts and willing to murder for a boy. And it's just that simple. You're so malleable. You're you're kind of evil. If you're really rich, you're spoiled. You're entitled. You you can't do anything. And if you're not too poor, but not too rich, like Marb was, then you're fine. You're perfect. It's the Goldilocks. Yeah, he's got the Goldilocks theory of social class going on here probably calculated towards his target audience people who don't want to think of themselves as poor and also know people that are far wealthier than they are and they just kind of like you know just go that middle of the road middle class target that book there and uh, see what happens that's maybe that's a cynical way of looking at it for me but you know maybe it's just a calculation of to what his target audience is and just playing to that but you know aside from the cynical viewpoint i Really, really enjoyed reading this book. It was a great way to get back into the meat and potatoes of Fear Street. That stupid freaking Fear Street saga was just like grinding away at... uh, (laughs) We came into Fear Street saga thinking this would be like amazing. This would be great. And it was great for getting a new perspective on Fear Street mythos. But as a story, as like books that... I'm reading, it did nothing for me, it was terrible, and getting back in this book was probably, like, the best way to get back into Fear Street, because I've, again, like, kind of regained faith in what I'm doing here, regained a little bit of faith in Arl Stein, realized, like, okay, he's at least still better than Joe Hill, we'll give him that much, and we'll, you know, soldier on. This book was pretty freaking great, like, definitely enjoyed it. This is, like, one of those where, if you haven't read any Fear Street books, you can jump in with this one, and you'll get a good idea of what it is, and it probably won't put you off the series. Another good thing that I felt he hit on with poverty was when he described, I think, two of her dinners. One of them was the hot dogs with Marb, and the other one was a peanut butter sandwich with chips. I think we've all had those moments in our lives where we're not, like, flush with the cash, and you need to find a cheap, simple meal, and you just end up making yourself like really crappy hot dogs because they come in like big packs and they're cheap, relatively cheap. Or the peanut butter thing, you just have the peanut butter lying around and you like find some chips and it's not the healthiest thing, but it's like all you can really have. And also like the not having the meals with your families. Those are the meals that she was having before she really hung out with that group. And then when she got into that group, they started taking her to the corner. They would buy her like burgers and fries. And like, it really was just like showing her how the rich live. Right, because if you're waiting for your next paycheck to go grocery shopping, like maybe all you have is like that bulk jar of peanut butter you bought and you're just going to, you know, scrape out some peanut butter and maybe you still have a slice of bread left and, you know, that's going to be that. And maybe when you run out of that slice of bread, you're just going to eat the peanut butter and there you go. I mean, maybe you're just going to eat some ramen noodles if you happen to have some left over. I mean, you eat what you can until you can, like, get your next paycheck. I mean, that's what you do normally, right? But then she sees the other side where it's like, 
like, oh, you know, we'll just... Go out to eat. We'll just go out to eat. Whatever. What's the big deal? Get a burger. What's NBD. Whatever. We'll drive there. Can we talk about how her mom has no concept of gun safety? And her mom should really... And that's the weird thing, too. Like, her mom is like... It says out loud, oh, I, I knew when my husband, you know, my ex left this gun here and it would be uh, trouble. It was never a good idea. And then she puts it back in exactly the same spot it was before. And it's like, really? If you think it's a bad idea to have this gun here, then... Put it somewhere where your daughter doesn't know where it is. Oh, or... well, she actually put it in the drawer underneath it that was lockable, but then it was like a very easy to pick lock. Yeah, just put it somewhere else or get rid of it. Or Sell get it. a gun box. Yeah. I don't know. Like, okay, you know, gun box, you know, it costs money to buy a gun box. Maybe we're being classist again by assuming she can buy one. Well, then maybe don't have the bullets in the same place you have the gun. There you, go. you know, that's one of like the top tips that people say, like for gun safety is like put the bullets in a different place. Or why have it in your living room? Why not have it in your bedroom? Exactly. Where your daughter doesn't know where it is. Like literally your daughter and her friends had a gunfight. Are we doing nitpicks or thoughts in the book and readings? Well, both. Maybe this is a nitpick. I don't know. But it's like your daughter and her friends had like gunplay in the living room. And your idea is, well, I'm just going to put it in a place that she sees me where I'm putting it. If she's putting it in the living room because she thinks her daughter might need it for safety, it's locked. Right. So you have made it more difficult to access because if someone's breaking in, she cannot pick that lock in enough time to make that gun useful. So there's no reason to put it there in the living room. So why not put it in her room? Do you think that Northwood was recording the entire morning when he was like out painting his shed and out by the wood? Or do you think he had turned it on right after he was shot? Or do you think he turned it on right after the kids were coming? So my little theory is that he was not recording himself painting his shed. That would be crazy. I don't think Northwood is actually crazy. What I think though is that he did have the tape recorder on him. I mean obviously he had the tape recorder on him and it was all primed and ready to go. He got shot. And I think he probably like passed out from the initial shock of, you know, getting shot. But I think he ended up coming to and he ended up hearing the beginning of the conversation between Joanna and Dennis. And that's when he like kind of gathered the strength to hit the record button. And because they were so distracted talking to each other, they didn't see him do that. And I think that's when he started recording. Either that or... He saw Dennis come at him with a gun and he started recording and they had like a little conversation before Dennis shot him. We talk about how Dennis's plan in that case doesn't really make that much sense. Like how did he know how long Joanna would have taken upstairs? He had no clue, right? She could have witnessed the entire thing. She could have just locked the door and been like, you're not coming back in here. Oh, that would be so cold. He's just stuck there. Well, the thing is like, even when they came, yeah. Once they dust for fingerprints on the gun, like his fingerprints are on the gun. Yeah. So she could just be like, well, there's no gunshot residue on me. His prints well, are on the gun. Well, he's assuming that his family can get him a really good lawyer. Maybe this is because I'm no longer a teenager. I didn't think Northwood was that much of a hard ass. He was being very reasonable. And I went over this earlier in the episode, right? Where I'm like talking about, the dude just doesn't want to make two tests. I think two tests he's like you don't need to do two tests like you that's not need to do two tests right if you want it to be completely fair and he's interested in fairness well like i said i've definitely done makeup tests where it was the same exact test they just don't return the test until everyone's taken it once everyone's taken the test then they release it to the students to look at if you know what you're doing then you know if you answered the question correctly or not and as long as you know what the questions are you're fine that's still not i'm not even talking about the test i'm just talking about like everything they were nailing him for like oh he's so he just sounded like one of those old strict teachers that's done playing games with kids and just doing their own thing and like just wanting their kids to learn and that's that like do you think it's like if you had read this book as a teenager Do you think you would have thought, oh, that teacher is, like, awful? No, because I'd be like, oh, Bahama vacation? Give me a freaking break. (laughs) Maybe that says more about me than, like, Mr. Northwood, but I don't know. I think he was fine. As the teacher, like, he's the figure of authority, right? So he's entitled to make the rules. That's literally the whole structure of high school is that the teachers make the rules and you obey them. I had a lot of strict teachers, too. Guess what? You just suck it up and go with what they say, and that's, like... The rule that everybody plays by. If you have like a really strict teacher, let's say that's been his policy the entire time and a lot of other kids had to put up with it. Why should he make the exception for this one kid, Dennis, when like handfuls and like dozens and like scores of other kids have had to put up with the same rules, be it a stupid rule, be it a strict rule, be it a reasonable rule, whatever. Everybody else has put up with it now. Why does he have to make the exception for this one guy? 
And the fact that it's like a Bahama vacation is irrelevant. Nobody else had to like get an exception, so why do you have to get Well, one? what I thought was funny was when Marb and Joanna were talking about how, like, yeah, he seems to be gunning for the rich kids. Oh, well, we don't have to worry. We're not rich. Well, why don't you pull some of the crap the rich kids do and see if he, like, punishes you the same way? I don't think he was necessarily just targeting the rich kids. I think the rich kids were being entitled little dicks, and he was just reacting how people react to that. That's true. They're not making requests for, like, weird extra exams or, like, makeup extra credit, whatever. Or not writing their essay in decorum. They're just being, like, normal students keeping their heads down and doing what they're told. And then these people are, like, acting out. They're, like, making themselves a target for the teacher. So, but, yeah, no, obviously, I, I don't think it's us being old. I think it's just common sense. Mr. Northwood is not that bad. He's a little bit quirky, but at least it serves Joanna in the end to, you know, spare her from, like, being convicted of a crime she did not commit. Do you think there's hard feelings between her and Northwood after this? Uh, that's that's a tough one. Like, we don't even know how he survives. You know, maybe he doesn't do so well, right? Maybe he, he's, like, partially paralyzed from this or who knows what. I mean, like, there could be, like, problems. Like, maybe they never talk and, you know, and she never finds out how he feels about it because he doesn't come back to school. It could be that. Do you think she'll visit him in the hospital? No. She's crazy. <laughs> You know, I think Marb is the real MVP here. How is she the MVP? She didn't do, she didn't affect anything. She tried her best. She tried her best. And like, I feel like she was But in the end, it didn't really matter, did it? It didn't really matter. But like, I feel like, you know what? I liked her. (laughs) I think like everyone wishes they could have a friend like Marb. Yeah, no, seriously. And I think like everyone takes their Marb for granted. So you know what? Go talk to the Marb in your life and let them know that they're appreciated. Take this moment right now. Just take a breath and think about who is the Marb in your life? And then realize everything that they've done for you and uh, give them a call. Be like, hey, thanks. Or a text because just calling and saying thanks might be a little weird and no one likes phone calls anymore. So a text (laughs) would be nice. But no, but this is Marb we're talking about. She's going to be happy that you called and took that personal touch. Because Marb's not going to be like petty and like, you know, ding you for calling instead of texting. I feel like texting is also a personal touch. Listen, you're making an effort. Just make an effort. However you and Marb (laughs) communicate, just communicate with your Marb and let them know that. You know what? Next time, maybe you bring the soup. How about that? Metaphorically speaking, you know, whatever the soup is in your relationship, you bring the soup next time. You know, spread the love, pass it on. I think that's probably the message of this book. That's going to be our takeaway. Speaking of which, how many soups out of five would you give this book? You know, I've rated it on Goodreads and I don't remember what I gave it. I think my review on Goodreads basically said that, you know, I really loved, you know, the classism that he touched on in this book. And I also mentioned he also brought the worst tendencies that he has into this book. It's it's a solid three on the Fear Street scale. I'm actually going to give it two and a half chicken noodle friendship soups out of five to round up to three on my everything scale. I really enjoyed this book. This was a fun ride. I really enjoyed bringing Broad along and into Joanna's crazy, crazy world. It was just a very memorable experience and definitely a recommend for somebody that's just looking for a way to get into the series. This is not a bad place to start, to be honest with you. It's not steeped in as much like mystery or like fear streetiness, but it is a good novel and it does feature some of the characters that generally tend to come back. So yeah, definitely a a two and a half runs up to three, which is very exciting. I mean, after the last two novels that... Yeah, I mean, like, writing, like, period pieces about, like, the 17 and 1800s is definitely not R.L. Stein's style. He should try to stay away from that, focus on this whole high school narrative that works much better for him. R.L. Stein is back. So, on our next episode, we are going to be reviewing Fear Street Bad Dreams. And looking at the cover for this book, we got these two girls they're sitting in bed they're wearing these white nightgowns and they're frightened one of them is just freaking out she's got her hands out and she's just got this expression of fear fright just terror on her face and the other one is kind of holding her trying to comfort her a little bit but is also looking straight out in like this expression of terror so we have two scared girls in bed and there's some bad bad dreams I think that there's going to be a girl having weird sleep paralysis type nightmares. So this is where you like kind of wake up and you're like hallucinating a weird thing, but you can't move. And she tries to get her friend or maybe her sister 
to help her with it. What happens is that her sister gets dragged into the weird dreams too. And I bet it's going to tie back to some weird guy who is preying on the girls. So he's like, maybe like a stalker type character, right? And I'm going to say the murder weapon is a gun. The murder victim is male. And there is a female murderer. And those are my predictions. So I've read this book already. I'm going to read what I wrote before I read the book. A girl is having bad dreams, aka nightmares that are coming true. From creepy spiders to accidents to murder. She dreams about her own impending murder or that of someone close to her. The murder weapon will be strangulation, the murder victim will be female, and the murderer will be female. Dun dun dun. Alright, well our predictions are in place and we are all set to go and record our next episode as soon as I finish reading that book. Just remember, guys, every burden, every disadvantage, just learn to manage because you don't have a gun to brandish and don't throw away your shot. Um, is that like a Hamilton quote? I listened to a lot of Hamilton for this book, <laughs> specifically because of the Hamilton reference. There's like, Yeah, there's like a couple of Hamilton references. I'll, I'll grant you that. Maybe like another reason to kind of like this book a little bit. I listen to a lot of Hamilton, guys. <laughs> a lot. All right, on that note, thank you very much for listening. We really appreciate it, guys. If you have any comments, let us know, and see you next time. And just remember, geniuses, lower your voices. You got to keep out of trouble and double your choices. Don't throw away your shot. (laughs) Bye! Peace! We hope you enjoyed this episode of Red Read Podcast. Join us again as we continue our journey down Fear Street. We love hearing from you guys, so feel free to reach out to us at Red Read Podcast on Twitter and Facebook. Email us at red.read.podcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Once again, thanks for listening. See you again soon.